Hi YouTube, I'm Iman. Welcome back to my auto repair videos. In this video, I'm going to give you steps on how to diagnose and solve the problem of air bubbles in your cooling system in the 2004 to 2009 Toyota Prius. So before we get started, I just want to say, firstly, this video is going to be mostly talking, but it's also going to be a guide because uh, mainly we're going to be talking about the problem at hand. So first off, my dad bought this car from a friend who already spent like three months trying to solve a problem that he had. And his problem was that even though he could drive fine in the back roads, like thousands of miles, when he went on the highway and drove only about 30 or 40 miles, the car overheated. And he found out that when, uh, when the car overheated, the coolant went from the radiator to the, the radiator all the way to the uh, uh, coolant reservoir and it started overfilling, which also caused it to overheat. The way that he found this out was that normally in a car, when it cools down, the radiator will suck uh, coolant from the reservoir and there shouldn't be any pressure. Uh, however, when he opened the cap, uh, which is like this, uh, he noticed that there was pressure and that was actually flowing to the reservoir, which is something that shouldn't be happening. And, and he also noticed that the reservoir was full instead of empty. So let's talk about the cycle, uh, the system in which this works. So when you turn the car on, first it takes water from the coolant heat storage tank and it circulates all the way past the coolant flow control valve to the engine. And as the engine works, it's gonna, the, the coolant is gonna heat up and when it, when it reaches a temperature of around 200 degrees, it's going to move, the thermostat's gonna open, it's gonna move down to the radiator and then the radiator is gonna cool the uh, coolant down then it's gonna go all the way back and recirculate to the engine block. However, if you turn the heater core on, uh, and you use the heater core on if you want to heat the cabin, if you turn the heater core on, then the water, instead of circulating to the uh, radiator first, it will circulate to the heater core because it's hot water. So once it circulates through the heater core, it's going to circulate back through the auxiliary water heater pump to the coolant, the coolant flow control valve. And I mentioned this earlier, but the coolant flow control valve uh, controls whether the coolant comes from the heater core or from the tank. And once it goes through the, the valve, it will recirculate back and then it will go to the engine block and then the cycle will continue. And that's basically how the system works. So if you have a problem in any of these, so if the heater core doesn't work or there's something wrong with the radiator, then the whole system is uh, flawed. All right, so another component I forgot to mention is the electric water pump, which I think is down here. Now, the first thing that the old owner did was replace the electric water pump, and uh, that still didn't solve the problem. So then he also tried to replace the, the cap, because the cap also regulates pressure, because you'll see that it has a spring in it that uh, also blows back when, you, when it's too pressurized. Let me put this back on. And he also tried to replace the radiator uh, because the radiator might have clogged. Uh, the old owner couldn't figure out how to do that, so he sold it to my dad, who then actually replaced the radiator. The, ra do you want me to get? the radiator is right here. And that still didn't work. So then, so then he tried to replace the thermostat. The thermostat is down there, I can't really point it out, but the thermostat also regulates pressure because, well, not really regulates, but if the thermostat doesn't work, then it's gonna cause a buildup of pressure because it's not opening in time. So when he replaced the thermostat, it also didn't work. So when we look at this diagram, we figure out that a whole ton of these things have been crossed out and he reasoned that it can only be the auxiliary water heater pump or the coolant, control, the coolant flow control valve. Now, he thought it must have been, it's 90% the auxiliary water heater pump because the coolant flow control valve is just a valve. Uh, another thing to mention is that a new auxiliary water heater pump costs around $400 uh, new. A new coolant flow control valve costs around, oh, a new <sighs> coolant flow control valve costs around $80 new. So what my dad did was he bought a new coolant uh, flow control valve and he bought a used uh, auxiliary water heater pump. So just now we did a removal of the auxiliary water heater pump and we actually figured out that indeed 
it's not working. So, we also have another video on that. So that means that we finally found out the source of the problem. Now, I should also talk about why it's so hard to diagnose what the problem is. Because usually, when any component of the system goes wrong, the car should throw an error code. So for example, when the coolant uh, flow control valve goes uh, malfunctioned, it should send an error code of like P1121. However, this time it didn't send an error code, so it was hard to diagnose. Uh, I also forgot to mention that my dad, uh, during the course of this, he bled the car like 10 times. And each time it didn't work. Uh, by the way, uh, bleeding is a very lengthy process and it takes a long time to do. Uh, but I'll tell you about that later. So another thing that I want to mention, I want to mention is that when you buy a car to fix a similar problem like this, you first you want to make sure it's important to first make sure that you make sure that the engine is working, that there's no leak present or that the uh, head gasket isn't blown, for example. Uh, so my dad used block tester, which is a sort of chemical right here that we put on the head of the coolant and then we turn the engine on and when the engine runs, if the gas inside changes color, that means there's something wrong with it. My dad did that and he found out that there was nothing wrong with it. I don't know why I keep going back here, but another way you could do it is just simply check the oil, see if there's anything murky on it and we already knew that there's nothing wrong with it, and that the head gasket's not blown, so... Okay. Alright, so I might have said a few things wrong, uh, maybe something off the gas. But basically, uh, we tested it, and uh, nothing was indicated that was wrong. Um, and you, it's because it's, really, it's, a bit, it's a bit cold right now, it's around 32 degrees right now, and that's why I have a radi radiator right here and uh, my nose is, maybe my nose is running a bit, but just know that we tested it and nothing seemed to be wrong. Seemed to be. I'm Iman, and I just showed you how to diagnose and solve the problem of the red triangle of death display with the high temperature warning, uh, which indicates air bubbles in your system. And I'm sure that any mechanic or any person who worked with cars will tell you that the cooling system of a car is really complicated. Uh, I know my 8th grade teacher did because he taught us about the systems of cars. And the, cool the cooling system for this Prius is complicated as well. The reason why this car, uh, when compared to other cars, is more susceptible to air bubbles is because of the coolant heat storage tank. So when you turn the engine on, uh, coolant will be directed into the system by the tank. And with that, the air bubbles that are already inside the tank will come with them. So as the engine works and it heats up, those air bubbles will expand. And because of that, since this is a closed system, the air bubbles that expand will push the coolant in the uh, radiator to the reservoir. So when you turn the engine off, coolant is redirected back into the tank. However, the coolant that's in the reservoir won't be able to come back because there's pressure caused by air bubbles that won't allow it to. So here's a demonstration. So this, this uh, pocket of air right here would be an air bubble. So when you heat it up, it would expand and it would cause the uh, other liquid to push out. And imagine that there is a, another tank, like I'm referring to the radiator. So imagine that it's pushed to the, radi to the, uh, no, the reservoir. And because of the pressure caused, it's not going to be able to come back into the system because of the pressure. I just wanted to say that this video is more to help the people like me who tried to find out why this why this problem happened and the resources on the internet were actually really limited. So if you're a mechanic or you've had experience with this car, uh, please contribute to the discussion down below. Uh, for example, we might have done something wrong or some other people might have questions about this car. So feel free to help them. Um, so that being said, if you want to know more about this car, for example, how to refill the coolant, how to bleed it, I, I think I mentioned that before or even how to replace the auxiliary water pump. And we've, we've done a video on that. It's a very lengthy video. I do recommend it. Feel free to recommend to explore our channel. Uh, I'm Ayman, and thanks for watching. If you like our comment, subscribe, look at videos on I and Ayman, especially the auto repair videos. And we're also doing a video on replacing the coolant control valve, even though we figured out the problem is the auxiliary water pump. Because maybe, just maybe, there's a chance of the coolant control valve also being malfunctioned. So feel free to check that out. and. I guess that's it. Signing out. Peace.